Thank you, Dr. Yavit. Um, obviously, you can hear me with the microphone. I am not shackled to the to the podium. I have a tendency to roam around. So, if you can't hear me, let me know. I'll move back. Uh, the other requirement that I request is, if you have any questions, don't wait till the end. Just either raise your hand or just blurt it out, uh, because. Uh, It'll still be fresh in my mind, it'll be fresh in your mind, and uh, we'll see uh, what uh, uh, what the answer will be. Now, working for the government means that I have to give you a disclaimer saying that everything I say doesn't necessarily represent the view of the government. Uh, I'm not going to bother to read this other than to say uh, my superiors were happy with this, uh, so for whatever it's worth. Okay. When I started working on this, I asked my dog, because all dogs are smart, right? They know who they're they know who they depend on. I said, How would you like to hear my presentation? Well, the first thing she did was yawn, then she laid down. And that was not a very good sign, but I decided to go with it anyway. Okay, now that all the shenanigans are over, let's talk about the uh, Fukushima Daiichi incident, our nuclear disaster that occurred in March of this year. Uh, this particular nuclear power plant is a boiling water reactor. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, their insides in a couple minutes. Um, this reactor accident uh, occurred not because of uh, necessarily reactor design, but because of unforeseen uh, design specs that were insufficient. The Fukushima Daiichi plant contained four nuclear reactors. Plant number one uh, had an energy output of about 439 megawatts and been operating for about uh, 40 years. Uh, units two through four are 760 megawatts and operating since 1974. And I compare these to the U.S. plants. Uh, the typical U.S. plant uh, is somewhere around 1,000 megawatts. So uh, the combined output of these four plants is about two power plants in the United States. Uh, this is a, uh, a typical diagram of this particular type of uh, plant. Uh, we have a steel and concrete frame building. Uh, the reactor is in toward the center, uh, and uh, this is where all the issues started. We'll take a schematic view of this. Uh, some of this is translated from the Japanese, so any misspellings will be the result of translational errors. I try to correct all of them, but I, it's not spend, it's the spent fuel pool. In this particular reactor uh, design, the reactor itself is this portion. This is the reactor containment vessel. These are the control rods that contain the uranium oxide. Uh, water level here, uh, this is a wet well and dry well. Uh, steam is generated comes out, feed water goes back in, it's recirculated, it boils, and so on. Uh, on this particular reactor design, the fuel rods are entered from the bottom. On a pressurized water reactor, which most of the reactors in the U.S. are, uh, the fuel rods enter from the top. Uh, that's all we're going to talk about nuclear reactor design uh, for today. Uh, the other thing about this is that there's two containment issues. We have a, a primary containment inside the main reactor building, and then on the outside we have the concrete secondary containment. Uh, it's not uncommon for radioactivity to, to leach out of these areas, getting into the, the dry wells and the wet wells and some inside here. Uh, because the boiling water reactor design is a little strange uh, compared to U.S. standards, and it's the same for all boiling water reactors, the steam that's generated here is radioactive and it excess the containment building. In a pressurized water reactor, uh, there's a heat exchanger, this fresh steam line never leaves containment as recirculated. There's a heat exchanger that heats up the main feed water to the turbines. It's a lot safer design. Alright, so what happened? Uh, March 11th uh, this year, there was a a 9.0 Richter scale earthquake in the Sea of Japan, about uh, 81 miles east of Sendai, Japan. 
And that's about 95 miles northeast of the Fukushima complex, which is in this general vicinity. Uh, if you go to Google Earth, and uh, you can actually see these on Google Earth once you uh, drill down toward those, uh, toward those reactors. The earthquake itself the, uh, was not much of a problem uh, per se. Uh, its aftermath, the tsunami, was the big issue. Here we see part of the tidal wave coming ashore. Uh, this bus or van being tossed around like, uh, like a Nerf ball. And some of the results of the earthquake itself. What happened, though, is that the reactor design uh, failed because the seawall wasn't high enough. Now, before we talk about that, the entire world seemed to focus on the reactors and the potential for the release of radioactivity. That's well and good, as they should have, but in the process, a lot of things seem to be put to one side as, quote, not being important. And this is some of the information that was given, and this is just as important, if not more important, than the potential reactor incident. We had 11,000 confirmed deaths, 180,000 homes without power, 260,000 people uh, without water, uh, 2,000 emergency shelters, and so on. Uh, almost uh, 175,000 people were displaced. Uh, this was kind of lost in the shuffle because everybody else seemed to focus in on, on the reactor. Why is that? Who wants to take a guess why? Yes? Is that high global impacts? Which one? It had global impacts. Well, global, yeah, global, well, yeah, global impacts. But I think you could you could probably sum it up in one word, and that's the R word: radiation. You mention radiation to somebody, what happens? They kind of step back, shiver. They have a shiver in their body, and they say, "Oh my God, we're going to all die because of radiation." Well. When you sign up for the emergency uh, preparedness courses through Dr. Yalda's department, you'll find out that it's not always bad. Got to get a plug in for you, right? Okay. Let's talk about the early phase of the reactor accident. We talked about the tsunami. Uh, the tsunami came in about an hour after the earthquake. Uh, the earthquake itself shook about 11 reactors on the island of Japan. All those reactors shut down like they were supposed to. Uh, in the uh, earthquake that happened in Virginia a few weeks ago, the uh, North Anna nuclear plant in Virginia shut down like it was designed to do. Anytime there's a seismic event, in some cases greater than 0.1 uh, on the Richter scale, the reactors were shut down. When these reactors shut down as designed, that was fine, no problems. The big issue was off-site power was lost. Reactors generate power, but they don't generate power for themselves. They put it out on the grid. The grid has to come back in and run the reactor safeguards. Uh, off-site power was lost. Therefore, all the electric pumps in the facility were lost. However, backups were these diesel generators. Now, the diesel generators worked fine until the tsunami came in. They destroyed all the generators. They flooded out the, the generator rooms because they were not too high above sea level. And after that, the third level of protection came in and the battery backup starts. Batteries are only good for a short amount of time. Um, the batteries died about a day later. Uh, at the time this happened, Japan issued a three kilometer evacuation order. In the U.S., the evacuation zone around a nuclear power plant goes out as far as, uh, as 50 miles. On right, March 12th, the batteries were depleted. What happens? You can't cool a reactor, even though the reactor shut down, you have residual heat in the fuel rods. Pressure in the reactors increase. Venting is initiated. The venting will release radioactive material into the environment. And this is when the accident started. Uh, also, because the uh, cooling could not be maintained, the spent nuclear fuel pool starts to heat up. That has to be cooled because the old reactor fuel is taken out of the reactor and put into these cooling pools. 
So this pool level starts to drop, the fuel rods start to heat up, and they may or may not uh, rupture. Uh, the other thing, too, is that about one out of every 10,000 fissions in a reactor will produce hydrogen. So the grain splits, you'll get two, most of the time you get two fairly equal masses. Uh, once out of every 10,000 fissions, you'll get an, uh, an atom of hydrogen produced. So hydrogen built up, all it takes is to look at hydrogen funny, a spark sets it off, you have a hard, uh, hydrogen explosion, blew the top of the reactor building off, evacuation zone is increased. About this time, uh, a lot of federal agencies in the U.S. were notified. So here's again what happened. This is another uh, map. You see the diesel generator buildings down here. Uh, the elevation to protect the reactor is only about uh, a 10 meter uh, seawall. The tsunami was estimated for more than 10 meters. This flooded, and that started the whole uh, cascade of events. Satellite view before and after. Uh, we see four uh, reactor buildings, number one through four at the top, RB is reactor building. Each one of these reactor buildings, as I mentioned, has a steam line exiting the containment going toward the turbine building. So you have four reactors, you have four turbine buildings. The tsunami comes in, and this is what it looks like afterwards. You, you can compare these, all these structures down here were moved, uh, and all these up here were flooded, this was flooded, um, and that's, that's what happened. A lot of this wasn't necessarily reported until uh, uh, later on. Okay, I mentioned there was venting, and uh, this is a schematic of some of the steam diversion and venting. Uh, if you recall the first picture that I showed of the schematic of the reactor, the cooling water was up to about right here. Uh, with no cooling and no pumps to bring in water, uh, this water will evaporate and shutoff valves would vent it back to the wet wells. This generated particulates and aerosols and the whole area gets contaminated. You get, when they vent, this goes out to the atmosphere and you can see what's happening there. Uh, again, there's uh, because you have hydrogen building up in here, being vented in through here. This, you get hydrogen in here, build up, and this. Now, <coughs> they always talked about the reactor uh, accident, and they did the same thing with Three Mile Island. They never mentioned for a long time that it was a meltdown. Anytime you have an accident like this, 99 times out of 100, I can almost guarantee you it's going to be a meltdown. Because once the fuel rods get uncovered, it's going to be hot enough for something to melt. So this was a meltdown, same as Three Mile Island. I know several people who argued back and forth that Three Mile Island was not a meltdown. Uh, just the mechanics of the reactor accident will tell you that, and also Mother Nature doesn't lie when you have a reactor and certain isotopes are released to the environment. The only way those isotopes can be released is if you have a meltdown. And they got a camera into TMI so you can see the part of the core was melted. But anyway, this was a meltdown. Now what about the spent fuel? In the previous slide, you saw the spent fuel was, was cool, was filled. Here, you had a water leakage. They never they had a hard time finding out where it was leaking from. Uh, again, the fuel rods became uncovered. Fuel rods ruptured. More aerosols and more fission products went out through uh, the spent fuel. Okay, uh, there's another significant event. Japan thought they could cool the reactors by injecting seawater. What they were doing was sacrificing those reactors because anytime you inject seawater, or any type of water that hasn't been specially treated into a reactor, you essentially destroy the reactor. Uh, reactor water is very chemically pure, except with materials that they add to the water to control the chain reaction. Uh, seawater being seawater, once you put it in there, everything's shot. The reactor itself, the pipes, the tubing, everything. 
Uh, they started additional venting uh, a day or two later. Additional fire and explosion on the 14th and 15th and 16th of uh, 2011. And in the U.S., several emergency operations centers were activated, including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the U.S. EPA. Other resources were also activated. Uh, this is the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, of which CDC is um, one of the operational divisions, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. All of these were notified and activated because of the public health issues that would be associated with this accident. So here's a satellite photo from the 14th. This is from a, a uh, United Kingdom newspaper. Uh, you can see uh, the venting. You can see the top of the reactor building was blown off. Uh, you can see another damage here of this unit, unit one. Um, so this was a global disaster a global emergency because of all this material coming out, the smoke preventing, and because we're now in a global economy, anything that would impact the Japanese economy would also impact the world's economy. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier today that I received a call from one of our offices in uh, Boston. They received another request for information from the state of Massachusetts because they were concerned about radioactivity coming into car on cars being shipped in from Japan. Never would have thought about it. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those issues uh, later on. All right. Now I mentioned there was a uh, some evacuation uh, from the plant. Uh, this uh, was published in the Washington Post uh, the first. September of this year. Uh, you see the no entry zone, uh, uninhabitable for an extended period of time. Is radiation levels that high? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on what your level of risk is. Uh, other areas were evacuated a little bit further out. You have to spend an evacuation zone. Uh, for those of you who listen to NPR, there was a report a couple days ago uh, about. Uh, a reporter going into one of these evacuated areas, the Geiger counter, and uh, he was, for his report was that in about three hours he would receive the, uh, the legal limit of the radiation that an individual is allowed to receive. Uh, another issue here is look where Tokyo is, only 25 miles away. What's in Tokyo besides a lot of people? Well, the U.S. Embassy. So we had a lot of input from the U.S. Embassy, like. Can we drink the water? Should we inform the U.S. citizens to follow U.S. regulations or should they follow Japanese regulations? They're different. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes as well. So uh, you can see that uh, this, uh, here we went out to a 19 mile radius, that's still smaller than the U.S. evacuation radius for power plants in this country. In fact, when I was driving up through here, I said, this kind of area looks kind of familiar. I was just in Coatesville, uh, I think, in the end of last year for a nuclear power plant drill. And, I, and just, anyway, so, and this part of the area would have been covered because it was plant Limburg. So uh, this is a nuclear event. Why are other agencies involved? Why is the public health involved? Two issues, 1979, Three Mile Island, 1986, Chernobyl. Uh, what was observed was that the public received no uniform health message. Uh, there was no uniform message on what to do with livestock, what to do with food. Should you throw it away? Should you store it? Should you not eat it? Can you eat it? Can you wash it off? What should you do about food that's in cans? Is it radioactive or plus it's in a can? Uh, what can we do to prevent adverse health effects? Uh, from exposure to radiation. So there are no uniform messages on anything. So the government established this advisory team for the environment, food, and health, of which I'm a member. The permanent members of this advisory team are the EPA, the Department uh, of Agriculture, CDC, and the Food and Drug Administration. And what we do is, as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, provide answers to complex questions. We try to coordinate the advice we get from states, uh, 
tribes, local governments, other federal agencies, international agencies, uh, and uh, compress all this information down into a concise answer and then give it to somebody who requests an answer. Uh, although these are the four general agencies, other federal agencies can be added as needed. Across this happened in Japan, what other type of agencies do you think would have been involved in the response? Would have been a member of this advisory team? Anybody want to throw anything out? Customs and Border Protection. Why? Shipping containers coming in from Japan could have been contaminated. FAA planes could have been contaminated. Immigration and naturalization. What if you're sitting on a plane next to an individual who's radiologically contaminated? They don't know it, you don't know it. You're getting irradiated. What's your health issues? Should we quarantine people who come into the United States from Japan? How do we screen these folks? These were all issues that were handled by the advisory team and the CDC as well as uh, these other agencies. Um, okay, so I'll mention a very emergency operations center. How many people here have ever been in an emergency operations center? How many people have ever worked in an emergency operations center? Okay, well, not a lot. That's good. Because you have to learn at the bottom. Anyway, emergency operations center is the central command for any type of disaster whether it be a radiological disaster such as this, a flooding disaster which you uh, experienced about a week ago, uh, earthquakes, man-made disasters uh, such as plane crashes, uh, the shuttle disaster of a Columbia crash, uh, there was an EOC, several EOCs activated for that. Uh, and they're also used for exercises for training emergency responders. The purpose of the EOC is to coordinate all this information that comes in. So you have multiple specialties in the EOC, each one carrying out a certain mission. Uh, other names of the EOC, war room, situation room, crisis center, command center, whatever. However you define it, however you state it, it still goes back to being an emergency operations center. Regardless of the term, it's where brains, in theory, are located in the response, um, and it's where resources are allocated, where money is allocated to the resources, it's where all the logistics are planned. All of that occurs in the EOC. This is a picture of the uh, Emergency Operations Center at the CDC. This was not what it looked like during this event. Why? CDC is a disease center, not a nuclear disaster center. Uh, this was the uh, uh, exercise control center. Uh, this was for one of the pandemic flu exercises. Each one of these desks, each one of these monitors was for a specific function within the incident management system uh, of the CDC. Each one of these functions has a notebook such as this that tells what that function uh, for that particular desk is. Each one has a phone, speaker phone, uh, microphones, uh, and intercom systems, all tied back into this room. And I'll have a schematic of this. This is this is one uh, this is one example of of a fairly large emergency operations center. There's no set and stone design of an EOC. In fact, it turns out the CDC Emergency Operations Center is actually larger than the EOC Emergency Operations Center of the US EPA. Uh, each Emergency Operations Center does have functional disciplines, safety and health, for example, uh, fire, police, and medical. Uh, the CDC has a liaison with other federal agencies. It has a liaison with the Department of Energy, Department of Defense. Uh, it has liaisons with uh, a liaison desk for tribal governments, a liaison desk for uh, uh, other agencies, like I mentioned, uh, cities, counties, and so on. But the thing to remember is that the EOC is the critical link in any emergency response because it has to be able to reach back and coordinate with all the responders 
It has to know what resources are available and it has to know how to pull those resources in on a moment's notice. So this is the technical seating arrangement of, of an EOC. This is the CDC EOC. Uh, don't let the size fool you. The picture that you saw a few minutes ago was only of these chairs through here. Uh, these other places are situation rooms, uh, briefing rooms. Uh, uh, this is the room that shall remain nameless, as they like to say in the, at the EOC, because nobody can go in there unless you have the secret decoder ring. Uh, and you've got the usual restroom and so on. You have uh, an information center called the JIC, the Joint Information Center, where all the verbiage that leaves the EOC has to be cleared before it gets distributed to newspapers or whatever. Uh, you have work rooms in through here, uh, technical rooms back in through here. Uh, back in here is the, so the strategic national stockpile, which will ship emergency medical supplies within an hour's notice to any place in the United States. Uh, so this is a pretty complicated EOC. Uh, but again, that picture was only what you saw here. And then here is a wall of TV monitors. Uh, where did we sit for the Japan accident? We were essentially in these two rooms and these eight chairs. And I uh, say another 80% of the EOC was empty because CDC had no clue of what we were doing. All right, this is a revised incident management system uh, for the EOC. What you have here are the different sections. You have an operational section, the planning section, the logistics, finance. Those are the main structures of the EOC. Any, uh, excuse me, incident management plan. Uh, we have multiple sections. Here we have clinicians, we have uh, enterprise, uh, we have, I can't remember really some of these things. Uh, planning, science officers, technical special units. We have lead liaison officers, joint information center, security, safety, uh, strategic national stockpile, SES, and, S, and so on, up to the CDC director. These are the command staff positions. Uh, depending on the uh, on the incident, sometimes this command staff will come down a little bit further. Oops. So this is the life in the trench for the uh, CDC folks. You're looking right now at about 10% of the CDC's response capabilities for a, a nuclear radiological accident. That's me. We only have about 10 people out of about 7,000 in the CDC. We're all subject matter experts, which means that we know how to confuse everybody else with talking your jargon, and that's the problem. Uh, all the subject matter experts are either health physicists, such as myself, who are trained in radiation safety, nuclear plants, uh, environmental monitoring, environmental sampling laboratories, uh, biology, radiological health, <coughs> and we have some meteorologists who know enough about radiation to consider health physicists. You also have specially trained medical officers who know about uh, how you treat people who have been contaminated with radioactivity or how you have to decon these folks from internal contamination. So in a time of emergency, nuclear emergency, all the SMEs, CDC, if they're not deployed uh, to the emergency, are assigned to the CDC in several roles. Chief Health Officer, because we have to be able to take the information and convert it from radiation jargon to CDC jargon so that people can understand what we're talking about. We have to have a response section chief who can do the technical information and relay it to the Chief Health Officer. And then the other duties that is assigned, which is a catch-all for anything that somebody wants you to do, they say other duties is assigned. So this is a the draft, and I didn't think it's always a draft of the government, but they're very rarely going to finalize anything. Uh, here's the Japanese earthquake CDC history, incident management system org chart. All the green boxes are command staff. Uh, 
At one time, I was the chief health officer and science officer, and I reported directly to the deputy incident manager. Also, before we can report or interact with the chief of staff, and all these folks were just around if they were there doing their normal duties. But this response section chief and his assistant were all filling in and working on this one exercise. Now, there's multiple people in some of these boxes. They're not all health physicists. Some of them are epidemiologists. Some of them are uh, environmental health scientists, uh, people who wanted to help. Um, they would fill information, fill out information, crunch numbers, send it to the response section chief, who would send it to me, and then it would get relayed on up the chain. Uh, for the most part, I felt as if I was a paper pusher and the chief health officer, science officer, so I requested a different assignment because it's too much work. Uh, not, not, it's too much work that's not interesting. I mean, if you came up in the ranks of working in a lab or being a number crusher, why would you want to sit there and sign off on, and read reports and shovel it off to somebody else and get your hands there? Anyway, so this is an enlargement of that previous uh, slide. Uh, you can see you have an assistant to the uh, science gender response section chief, an executive assistant. All these people were tracking information and requests that come in. I'm going to show you what some of those tasks were in a couple of minutes. Uh, epidemiology surveillance, health issues of passengers, global migration, quarantine issues, uh, medical countermeasures. When do you administer, or how do you determine when to administer uh, drugs that could ameliorate the problems associated with uh, uptake of radioactive material? The advisory team, which I've talked about, environmental health issues, worker safety. Uh, uh, this is from the NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health folks. Population monitoring, um, food safety. That's FD. Now, food safety is interesting because the way the law is written, is it FDA or is it USDA? Depending on what the food is, will depend on who regulates that food. So, this food safety could also have another uh, line coming up to the advisory team. Environmental monitoring and population screening. So, all this was going on at once, and you could have 14 or 15 different things coming in and everybody trying to massage all this information. So life in the trenches was hectic. With only 10 people within the CDC, you can imagine the hours we were working. Uh, I remember one time I started work at 3 in the afternoon, quit at 11 o'clock, went home, and was working again at 6.30 the next morning. And I live about 60 miles from the CDC. So it was uh, not all right, so, as I said, I wanted to get out of being the chief health science officer. So I wanted to become the section chief. So here I am now, and it's the same, same block. Uh, maybe some changes depending on what the incident was. Uh, after the, toward the end of the, act of the incident, we decided that this executive assistant, Sam Keith, was better off if we uh, actually, we actually asked him if he wanted to go to Washington to be the liaison to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He was up there for about a month. He was working on this. So, uh, Sam is a, is, he's a, he's a resource that everybody should have. Okay, so, my life in the trench. As a chief health officer, what did I do? I was part of the command staff. Uh, I reported directly to the incident manager or the CDC director, uh, or the delegate, had to develop situational reports and scientific updates or briefings, uh, had to provide advice based on data we received, um, make science policy recommendations that, that may or may not be acceptable to the director of the CDC, uh, had to review a lot of media releases. Uh, a lot of it was redundant. A lot of it didn't make any sense because and you translate the jargon back into language that they want to distribute to the media, it's something that's lost in translation. Those are issues. Um, 
incident action plans. Approved incident action plans. All right, you're sitting here in this in this uh, in this presentation. Your job is to develop an incident action plan for what you're going to do next hour or tomorrow. So when you develop an incident action plan, what the chief health officer has to do is decide what you're going to do tomorrow, not knowing what the situation is today. And that's what an incident action plan is. It's the plan of how to attack the situation at the next operational period. For spot section chief duties, were, to me, were more enjoyable because they were specific for the response. We would get radiological data in, and I'll, I'll show you some of that in just a minute. Uh, we had coordinated planning for medical, public health, and scientific responses. Each one is different. What's the difference between public health and private health? Those are issues. You go to the doctor to, to discuss your personal or your private health, and you go to the CDC to discuss your, your public health. It's a matter of numbers. But also had to assist in developing the incident action plans with the chief health officer. So even though there was some overlap, this was, was, was more enjoyable because you were Get, you got to look at the data as it came in. You had, an, I personally had a better feeling for what the numbers meant than having somebody else who I don't necessarily think is, has already been working in Silicon in the field for maybe four or five years. They may not understand some of the nuances. Uh, they may not be able to quickly look through a, a, um, a list of numbers to determine what the, what the, what the, importance of those numbers are without crunching all the numbers. Uh, if I've got my hands on it, I can usually just kind of glance down and determine if this going to be a problem. Experience counts. So I mentioned that we had a task to do. What were some of the tasks? Uh, I wanted to do my own more. So these are some of the tasks that I, that I received. Each task was, was uh, given a number. Each task was tracked by one of the assistants. Each task was assigned to an individual. The date the assignment came in, the time it came in, when it was due. In some cases, these uh, tasks were due within hours of the time we received them. Uh, status of whether it was still open or closed. What was the issue behind the task? What kind of dose did you get from radioactive iodine? Believe it or not, Pennsylvania was in the forefront of this. Pennsylvania was where the iodine was first detected in drinking water, or at least in water in the country. And it was related to somebody down in Maryland and related to the CDC. Um, this was the very first, very first issue that came up. Um, the contaminated flyer, that's a passenger to camp. What was the impact of the contaminated fire? Some of this was uh, hypothetical. Uh, can you give us some information on a report that's not yet available? That's a good one. How are you going to answer that one? Well, I, I don't know. We don't know the answer because we haven't seen the number yet. You know, so uh, these are the kind of things that came in. Where do you need milk? Is the milk and I know in Washington safe to drink? What is safe? Um, can you throw it out? Can you save it? Depending on what the contaminant is in the milk, you can make cheese out of it and let it decay away. When you have to iodine, you lose, uh, after 90 days, whatever activity you have has been reduced to approximately 0.1%. Uh, so you can do that. Is rainwater safe to drink? Uh, what is, again, what is safe? Scent answer, you know, some of these overlap. So here you see scent answer from class 8146, uh, which is not on, on this list. But some of the tasks were the CDC upper management, who know nothing about or very little about radiation, rephrasing a task that they had already sent you and sending it back to you. So it's, it is another task that has to be completed and a lot of times we were just pulling out our hair saying, what do they want? How can we solve their issues? 
here is an example of Ask Anyone Can. Why are the standards in the U.S. different from the standards in Japan? What do these standards mean? Okay. Reported in Massachusetts rainwater was uh, environmental concentration of iodine 131 of 154 cubic yards per liter. Reported. It wasn't verified. It was reported. What's the standard for drinking water in the United States? That's the maximum contaminant level, which is the amount of radioactive iodine that is legally permitted in a public water supply, which is defined as the water supply uh, supplying at least 25 individuals, I believe. Three cubic yards per liter. So this is about 50 times higher, 51 times higher than what the legal limit is. I know there's some other nuances to this uh, MCL, such as four milligram per year to any in internal organ. All right. How many people curious is a milligram? Depends on the isotope. Depends on the amount that you have at the intake. So we had to we had to quickly explain to the folks upstairs that you cannot convert one to the other without knowing a lot of steps in between. World Health Organization, why are they allowing 270 people per year when the U.S. only allows 33 to so, And if you do the math, these numbers don't add up. They don't relate to one another. As I like to tell people, there's typical math, realistic math, and there's EPA math. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I used to tell my father there's the IRS way and his way, and the IRS way was always right. Uh, but anyway, drinking water standards in Japan, 2,000, 10 times higher than the World Health Organization, and uh, well, 900 times higher than the U.S. numbers. And then, that was for infants, for adults was even higher, and then why is it not the same in, in the air? So this is the concentration of loud air, this is the amount allowed for food in the, in the government, in, in the U.S. And notice the asterisk. Only foods destined for general consumption and also for infant milk and drinking water. So there's a little twist of all this information that causes a, a problem for these folks. All right. Uh, big question was, what type of risk are people are going to receive from ingestion of radioactive iodine? cancer. Uh, increased cancer risk in the U.S. if you had the limit. 1 in, one in 5,000, 1 in 4,000, and so on. What's the typical rate of cancer in the United States? Anybody know offhand? It's about somewhere between 30-40%. What's the mortality? It's about 20% or so. From a purely statistical point of view, if you have a population of 10,000 people, 20% of those people are going to get cancer and die from it. But it's never steady. There's always some noise in the signal, right? It goes up and down. Try to pick out one extra cancer in 5,000 people, or if you put this up to 10,000, two extra cancers when your variation may be as much as 10%. 10,000, which is 1,000. The problem is with these numbers is that you can never you can never con convince somebody that they're not going to get cancer. Or nor can you tell them you are going to get cancer because it's just there's just no way of knowing. These risk numbers are all are all over the place. But people like it. Uh, and it was part of the problem we had pulling out of here, uh, trying to tell the medical folks, the higher ups, that these numbers are calculated, but you cannot see it. Um, and background, by the way, is three millisieverts for 300 rounds. We, once you add in the average treatment for, for medical treatments, you double it. Uh, but anyway, these these are our views from the from the trench. 
We're going to do the same thing for cesium-137. Uh, all right. How do we decide what was going on in the U.S.? The EPA has a monitoring system called, they used to be called ERAMs, now it's called RADNET. Uh, they have a system of stationary mon uh, monitors which are indicated by the purple box, <coughs> and they have uh, multiple monitors uh, for drinking water, which are the orange ones, and gray dots are a mixture of the two. These are the ones that they have in the U.S. So everything coming from Japan, following the trail, uh, following the jet stream, or the typical winds, should be detectable up here first. Right? This is what was detected. Uh, this this is a report uh, that was uh, issued on the fourth, and I highlighted these. Uh, the highest numbers here, uh, I-9-131, the highest value detected um, is in Richmond and Marine in Idaho, the highest for cesium was 11. Uh, and then also Boise had the highest uh, I-9. So when the uh, the issue was, why are these numbers so different? How can you explain those numbers, again, to folks who don't necessarily understand atmospheric dispersion patterns or radiological sampling? These were other views from the trench. Uh, drinking water concentrations, <coughs> milk concentration, highest concentration of iodine in milk which is the biggest issue for infants, was in Hilo, Hawaii. What's the chance of getting milk from Hilo, Hawaii, here in Pennsylvania? Slim to none. Milk is one of those things that's a uh, quasi-local commodity. You get milk from the areas. You know, you don't ship milk, typically ship, ship milk across country. Uh, drinking water, Richland, Washington, highest concentration. 0.3. This was 10 times lower than the federal limit in drinking water, not rainwater. So, these are the, some of the yes. What about cream, though? It, it, it is shipped across the country. You guys look at that. No, EPA only samples the milk, and the cream would be made from the milk, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that wouldn't be that would be an issue if the milk were heavily contaminated. Mm -hmm. This is the act, this is the air monitoring at the reactor itself right here. You can see these are the highest dose rates here. We are looking at this to determine if the air movements were toward Tokyo or across uh, to the west in Japan or further out east. Uh, this is done by a, a helicopter flying over the site in a grid pattern. And then after you take the air monitoring, you do what's called ground truthing. You know where the airplane or the helicopter found the radiation, you go in and you take actual samples to verify that what they found were indeed true measurements of what's called ground truthing. So uh, this is the reactor area itself. Uh, the issue here, Department of Defense, how's that going to affect our military bases? All these military bases are situated down here. The radiation level down here were less than one night million R per hour. Background is about, uh, uh, that's about 100 times above background. So these are filled up data that came in to us and we had to evaluate and then come up with some kind of dose assessment. Gamma dose rates across Japan. This is in seven prefectures or seven, uh, essentially seven different counties in Japan. Uh, the background for this, uh, we'll call these numbers by, by 10. Those will be the typical background in Atlanta. 
background or somewhere between port one or the creek between these lines. So most of the gamma radiation levels were, all, were not too much above background. We actually had background to it. It was only in this prefecture that it was elevated. And you see how quickly it, it, uh, it decreased. The biggest issue that we had to deal with was the level of iodine in drinking water in Japan, excuse me, in Tokyo. Do you need to give people bottled water? What constitutes the need for bottled water? What is the dose? How long are these people going to be drinking contaminated water? How fast is the iodine clear? So uh, these are the iodine levels projected uh, through the end of March. You can see it dropped off pretty quickly. Um, again, the US standard is uh, about 0.2 or 3. So this was quite a bit above U.S. standards. The, the recommendation to all the, to the embassy was have the people, U.S. citizens, adhere to the drinking water standards of the U.S. so they should be using bottled water. Other cities across Japan uh, showed elevated levels of, of iodine. Those folks in the U.S. were also obviously told to follow those regulations. Um, because of the R word, a lot of people were scared. Calls to the U.S. Poison Control Centers to the Japan accident from March 11th to the 3rd of April. Uh, most of them were information. Because people wanted to know, is this going to harm me? Has it reached here? What's going on? So CDC had to respond to the Poison Control Centers with factions. All factions had to be sent through the chief health officer, through the Joint Information Center. All right. Japan had an evacuation zone. The U.S. has evacuation zones. The U.S. also has this thing called protective action guides. Uh, they haven't been updated uh, since the 1990s. Uh, they are being updated if it ever gets clear of the Office of Management and Budget. I think for the last year it's been bouncing around because somebody doesn't like some words. Um, you've seen this slide before. This was the monitoring results. Do these numbers exceed the protective action guides? What is a protective action guide? It's a projected dose that you're going to avoid by not going into an area. They're protected. There's three phases, early, middle, and late. Uh, for those of you who follow some emergency response drills and things, uh, in, in uh, Philadelphia, what happened uh, about a year ago, EPA had a drill called Liberty Rad X. Uh, a dirty bomb was theoretically set off near the U.S. Met downtown, Philadelphia. And the play was that all this has taken effect. We're going to exercise a late event. How do you move people back in? When do people move back in? So these tags define what steps take place during these events. Uh, the tags are also developed for specific issues. When do you stay in your house? When do you evacuate? Is it safe to drink food and water? How long can you eat that food and water? When can you uh, get back in? Uh, so if you're interested, you can go to this website and pull up the tags and look at it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'll give it a short. Um, in the U.S., if you project the dose, it's one gram to five grams. You open this uh, You can stay in your house. Uh, you administer potassium iodide if it gets up to 25 grams. Potassium iodide, the anti-radiation pill. Yes? How many people think it is? How many people say it's not? How many people don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, most of you don't know what I'm talking about. You can go on the internet and you type in potassium iodide and you'll see things calling this the anti-radiation pill. Like most of the stuff on the internet is wrong. 
Potassium iodide only protects one organ in your body, the thyroid. Mm. It's administered to prevent the uptake of iodine in your thyroid. So if you're exposed to something like cesium and you take potassium iodide, nothing happens. Right. So it's not an anti-radiation. And it's only good to about three hours before the iodine gets to you to about three hours after the cloud passes. So it's only a short period of efficacy in which you can administer potassium iodide. Okay, uh, we'll skip that to uh, the new task. How can you explain these PAGs to the upper management folks? Because they're very difficult. We have to keep it simple, we have to avoid jargon, or have to make it easy to understand. It's not easy to understand these things because they're developed by uh, DOE's NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration and the FIRMAC, which is the Federal Radiological Management <coughs> Monitoring and Assessment Center. And there are just booklets of maps and data that come out. Trying to get that down to something simple is very difficult. <coughs> so we came up with this, PAGs in perspectives. If the PAG is 100 million a year, and you take a cross-country flight, you have to take 25 cross-country flights, flights before you reach the pad of 100. Or you can have 10 standard chest x-rays. Mm -hmm. You'll reach the pad. Here, these pads are the dose that will be avoided if you don't do that activity. If you have a CAT scan, you have to have a 0 0.05 CAT scan. In other words, CAT scans give you a huge amount of radioactive radiation exposure. The legal limit for non-radiation workers in the U.S. is this. But a CAT scan gives you 20 times higher. So, we had to develop this chart to explain what the pad meant. They want to know what is on uh, average exposure of background radiation for one hour is huge. So these were issues. Uh, flyover data. Remember some of the dots on the maps? You had 12 and a half MR per hour, milligram per hour, uh, 1.19. If the pack is, for example, 2,000, you could be in that hour in that area for 160 hours before you reach the pad. 12.5 times 160 should be about 2,000. So based on the tag actions, the task for the chief health officer and the, the response section chief were to state the tags, what does the value mean, and where do these values come from? Just because it's in a federal document doesn't mean they're going to believe it. So we had to give a reference. 10 CFR 20 is a federal uh, code of federal regulations. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has protection of the public to ionize radiation. Uh, FEMA guidance for radioactive dispersal devices and, and improvised nuclear devices. This EPA 400 is the EPA PAG manual. Uh, so this is where all these numbers came from. And once they once they knew we weren't pulling these numbers out of our hat, of our hat uh, they felt comfortable saying that, yeah, you guys know what you're talking about. Again, remember, there's only 10 of us trying to tell other people these things. So, other issues need to be addressed. Thousands of shipping containers come to the United States every day. You have to survey every one of them. How can you survey every one of them? What instrument do you use to survey every one of them? What about airplanes? Do they need to quarantine incoming passengers? So what you do is you determine if there's passengers contaminated, what is the dose to the person sitting on either side of them? We had to figure that out. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, can radiation be considered a communicable disease? 
CDC's first name was the Communic Communicable Disease Center. They are more concerned with things such as sexually transmitted diseases and tuberculosis. They want to know if someone is, is radioactive, is that communicable? I said, well, uh, somebody else is getting exposed, but it's not a kissing disease. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a disease, it's just an exposure. Uh, should potassium iodide be administered? There are regulations that say when it should be done. How do you calculate the cancer risk? It was just, you know, just plug and shut, that's all that was. Uh, and this is a good one. Will you guys explain to us what's going on? And that's where all the reactor design stuff come in. Yes, ma'am. Is there any indication that Lou Gehrig's disease could have been a factor for radiation? We live near a three mile island. Right. Lou Gehrig's disease is, is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Yes. Um, my aunt who lived in Philadelphia died of it. My uh, husband died of it. Yeah. There has been no direct evidence that I'm aware of mm -hmm. from any type of radiation exposure, whether Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. Actually, the amount of radiation that came out of Three Mile Island, it was very, very little. Most of it was radioactive xenon, which is a noble gas. And noble gases, by definition, those by definition, cannot give you a radiological dose. Because you inhale it, it's not absorbed very well, and you exhale it right away. I'm sorry I can't answer your question, mm -hmm. but that's all I know about it. Again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not an MD. Um, you might, I can give you the, a number, uh, the number or the name of one of our medical folks who's been really watching the training. You can contact them and get a, a more precise medical answer. Okay. Did that help? Okay, good. Um, how do you do cancer risk? That's just, that's the equation in the verbiage. Uh, how can these issues escalate? Dose of the passenger, dose of the individual, uh, food or disposal. Again, you could save some food and a lot of it has to be disposed of. How soon can you return to the evacuation zone? Escort it to remove valuables. That's okay. Uh, somebody's going to come in there with you and say, okay, your time's up, leave. Uh, unescorted, unlimited return. That means, when can I go home without anybody escorting me home and can I stay there? Those were issues we had to had to uh, determine. What was our biggest challenges with the trenches? For us, it was educating the incident manager and the directors. How to define the terminology. I've thrown a lot of terminology at you. I've talked about milliland. I've talked about Sieverts. I've talked about peaky curies. I've talked about becquerels. All those, is, they're not jargon. Those are the, the technical issues associated with Radiologic exposure. <laughs> what does it mean? Go up to anybody. They, you know, unless you're radiologically uh, trained, you won't necessarily know what it means. You may have heard the terms. Uh, what's the difference between a rad and a rim? There's a difference. Uh, so we had to develop talking points that were clear, concise, and jargon free. And as hard as we tried, you cannot escape the jargon in some cases especially when you're dealing with radiological contamination. Uh, CDC is a health agency with environmental components. What's well, the industry exposure and dose? I have this, I enjoy this part. Right? Toxicologists talk about their dose is milligrams per kilogram per day. Is that a dose or is that an exposure? Or is that a dose rate or exposure rate? It's per unit time or per unit mass is usually some type of ratio. For radiation, you can be exposed without getting a dose, but you can't have a dose without being exposed. Uh, why are regulations different in the U.S. versus the rest of the world? Good question. Uh, the U.S. regulations for radiological incidents are probably like that. The rest of the world is probably an inch or so. Uh, how do you measure radioactivity and calculate exposures, doses, and risks? These were issues. Okay. In the U.S., I know I'm running out of time. In the U.S., there are four levels of radiological uh, emergencies. Uh, notification of an unusual event. I like to tell people that 
If you drop a wrench, you can consider that an unusual event. Essentially, it means that, that something has occurred that could potentially degrade the level of safety in a nuclear power plant. There's been no release of material. It goes up to an alert if events are in process or progress and have occurred which involve a potential or actual release. Um, when the earthquakes hit, the first thing that was declared was a notification of unusual event. Once the plant shut down, then it becomes an alert. Going on up the ladder, site area emergency, that means a major failure to the plant. So in Fukushima, if these were the U.S., they would have progressed up to site area emergency. Then as soon as they started venting and the tops blew off the reactors, it becomes a general emergency. So even a few mile island, it's definitely a site area emergency. And EPA didn't have PAGs back then, per se. And general emergency was declared. In the U.S., it's exercise, 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 and then after you finish those exercises, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Exercise some more. Uh, every two years, plants have to go through some of some of these events. Every six years, they have to go through a uh, one or two types of, of of emergency drills, either an IPX, which is, stands for an ingestion pathway exercise or a plume exercise, which means that the reactor has vented to the atmosphere, the cloud has passed over an area, and all the nuclear plants have concentric circles broken up into different uh, grids or sectors, and those sectors either have to, have to be evacuated or drilled with the being evacuated. Uh, okay, so that ends it. My dog's happy. Uh, and so now I want to open it up for questions. And she was looked confused, as I'm sure some of you are. Any questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about um, when they shut the nuclear reactor down, what is, where are they really shutting down? Because it doesn't seem like you can actually really shut it down because there's things that these things always generate heat. What you're shutting down is the, is the criticality. You insert the control rods into the reactor. Those control rods absorb neutrons. You absorb the neutrons, the reaction stops. But the reactors operate at about uh, five or 600 degrees Celsius. So you have, uh, uh, you still have latent heat built into the reactor. So all you're doing is you're stopping the reactor from generating power, but you still have all that heat built in there. Uh, likewise, when you start the reactor up, you just don't flip the switch. Have it come on. You, there are protocols that you have to initiate. 5% power, 10% power, 50% slant before they allow it to come back on to full power. So when you shut the reactor down, again, all you're doing is you're inserting the control rods, and it shuts the reactor down. It shuts down the chain reaction. In an emergency, it's called a scram. Everything just, boom, falls in. And it's a, uh, it's not a passive, it, it's, it's designed to be passive, too. So if you have complete power failure, the fuel rods go in by themselves. You don't have to have somebody push them in. You don't have to have the motor driven. They're all passive. So does that a question? Yes, sir. Um, with Japan, was there cooperation with the government in implementing your guys' uh, like pretty much game book? Or was it just directed at US citizens or did you guys kind of take a, a full lead in implementing that? Why don't you should ask that? The answer is yes and no. Um, the company that owned those reactors, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, is quite known for misleading the public. Big time. For example, a couple years ago, they said, oh, we have no problem with this plant. It's working fine. Meanwhile, there's a fire in the facility. Uh, there was an engineer 
who ran the National Radiological Laboratory in Japan was giving a, giving a, um, a um, statement to their, to their parliament. And when that somebody asked him, what type of information did you get from the company? He started screaming and yelling, saying that they were horrible. They never got any, any information. And to this day, this was maybe about a week or so ago, he still did not know what had happened in that reactor. So we did work closely with the, with the government of Japan. Uh, we had problems getting information from the company. And until the U.S. started going over there and doing some of their own data and, and verifying some of the results, we had no idea what was going on. <coughs> and people, somebody asked me a couple days ago, well, the reactors are stabilized. How about that? I said, that's what we've been told. I don't know what the answer is yet. Those reactors are still hot. They've been off for uh, three months now, four months, but they're still hot. They're still releasing some radioactivity in the environment. Uh, one of the samples came back positive for plutonium. They said, oh, well, that's just part of the natural background. Ah, no, no, it's not. Not at that concentration. Again, Mother Nature doesn't lie. Uh, I, can, I can go outside and tell you within 10 or 20 percent, if you dug a hole there, how much the uranium you would find, or how much uh, radium you would find. And if you find something more than that, then you probably have a contamination issue. And, uh, across nature is pretty uniform across the globe, plus or minus 50 percent, which is not too bad. Anything else? Yes? This whole uh, nuclear issue kind of like disappeared from the media within a month or two, how long did it take them to actually get the plants under control and what kind of state are they in now? I don't know what kind of state they're in now. One of the things that was considered, and I think they did, is that you know they started pumping in the seawater. They had to ship over some hydraulic pumps, similar to the ones you use to pump cement, uh, over to Japan to really flood the buildings. And then they brought in some water deionization, uh, portable water deionization plants to help refill some of the cooling areas that were not contaminated by the seawater. That was the last thing I heard, because after, after the advisory team was uh, stood down, we kind of went back to our day jobs. Uh, so the only thing that I know is been what's been reported in, in the news, in the newspapers. Uh, I just know that Personally, I don't think the reactors are stabilized. I heard that Japan is going to encapsulate them, uh, similar to what they did in uh, at the former Soviet Union with Chernobyl, but I hope they use better concrete. Uh, so that, that's all I can tell you, because that's really all I know. All right. I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.